I am Maddie. Welcome to Science Side Up. And our second episode in our climate dynamics series, we forgot the atmosphere. On our first episode, we found the surface temperature of the Earth based solely on um, a balance of energy, assuming that both the sun and the Earth were black bodies. And the temperature we got was way too cold. It was 255 degrees Kelvin which is about zero Fahrenheit or negative 25-ish Celsius. So we know that that's not the average surface temperature of the Earth. Today, what we're gonna do is get a much more realistic value by taking into account the atmosphere. But we're still just gonna do a very simple idea of an energy balance. What comes in must go out. The principle here is a very simple energy balance. What comes in from the sun must go out, but now we're gonna let that outgoing energy interact with the atmosphere and we'll see how that warms our surface. The picture we're really gonna rely on today is this guy. So the idea is that we have the sun with its incoming shortwave radiation. I forgot to write radiation. And that incoming shortwave radiation comes in, hits the Earth's surface, and then is going to come back out again. And then what we're gonna see is how that radiation, um, that outgoing radiation from the Earth is gonna interact with our atmosphere, which I represented by this like blue slab. Earth's atmosphere is kind of cool in how it interacts with this incoming shortwave radiation from the sun because you might notice that I drew it passing straight through the atmosphere. In general, our atmosphere is transparent to the incoming solar radiation, but when we have the outgoing long wave radiation from the Earth, remembering that the Earth emits in that infrared, much longer wavelength, lower frequency, lower energy um, coming from the Earth. When our outgoing long wave radiation from the Earth hits the atmosphere, it's going to stop. So for this model, um, we're going to say that the atmosphere is opaque to that outgoing long wave radiation. So it's transparent to the incoming and opaque to the outgoing. Now this is a simplification. It would be better to say that this is like leaky, so some of this outgoing does in fact go out to space, but that's just one of the ways that we can make this simple model more accurate. What I'm trying to do for you guys today is just help you have a picture of what's going on in our atmosphere. So we're not going to worry about being super, super precise. We just want to see how including an atmospheric layer can warm the Earth in a black body balance. So we have this outgoing long wave radiation. And what happens is this outgoing long wave radiation gets absorbed by specific particles in the atmosphere. And the particles, the different elements and molecules that can absorb in the infrared range, right, in that wavelength that the Earth emits at, that's what we call greenhouse gases. So some good examples that we have pretty abundantly in our atmosphere are going to be water vapor, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Now there are others, but these are going to be kind of the most important. So these guys absorb that outgoing long wave radiation. It's really the same process. And conceptually, it's the same thing as when the Earth itself absorbs the incoming solar radiation. So these guys absorb all of that outgoing long wave radiation, and then they're going to re-emit it. Now, they happen to also re-emit in the IR range because of how these molecules work. That's some pretty complex chemistry stuff, so I'm just going to ask you to take my word on it. Um, so these guys re-emit. And when they re-emit, they actually re-emit in all directions. But mostly what we're concerned about is whether it emits up or down. 
because if it emits to the sides, it'll just get absorbed by something else in the atmosphere and then re-radiated. So we don't need to worry about what's going on inside the atmosphere. We care about the energy exchange between the atmosphere and the Earth and then the atmosphere and space. So let's draw our little arrows. So if we were to group all of this together, let's see, what color should we use for greenhouse gases? Um, let's use this red. Here we go. So these are going to re-emit back down to Earth. And then the Earth, in turn, emits that back up. So we get a little cycle here. Um, and we'll get back to that cycle in a second. We'll also, we also want to show that the energy out is that energy to space. So this is for our opaque atmosphere. Um, this is sort of how the energy is going to be transferred. Solar energy comes in. Earth's energy gets emitted, absorbed by the atmosphere, and then half of that is re-emitted down to Earth, and it kind of has this cycle, right? And then the other half is emitted out to space. Now let's play with some equations. We're going to use our same equation as last time, our F equals sigma t to the fourth. So our energy in, that's kind of our concept of what this F is. It has different units. It has units of watts per meter squared. But we're going to think about it as that energy in. Our energy in has to equal uh, Stefan Boltzmann constant times temperature to the fourth power. Now the difference here from what we did in our first episode is that we're going to separately consider the temperature of the surface and the temperature of the atmosphere. So if we look at the top of the atmosphere, what's coming in from the sun and what's going out, this balance is exactly what we calculated last time. But instead of us assuming that's the temperature at the surface, we now understand that that's going to be the temperature at the top of the atmosphere. So if we're looking down at the temperature of the surface, we're going to consider our energy in, which is that energy from the sun, but it's plus this energy we're getting from the atmosphere. So we can already see that this is going to be warmer because I have what we started with last time plus something else, which is energy, is going to equal that constant times temperature to the fourth power. So cool. Join me over here as we're going to like do this math. Um, so what's cool here is that this relationship, that the energy in from the sun equals sigma t alpha to the fourth, that stays true. Um, and so we can substitute in our F sun, right, and F atmosphere, and solve for our temperature. So when we do that, oops, Sorry. Um, I'm hoping Santa brings me a wireless lav mic for Christmas so that I'm not constantly worried about tripping over the wire connecting me to my phone, which I'm filming on. So what we've got here is, so our, we know our value for our energy from the sun. That's just sigma t alpha to the fourth. So sorry, sigma times temperature of the atmosphere to the fourth plus, well, what about this like F atmosphere? Well, that had better be the temperature of the atmosphere, right? So that's going to be, we can write that as sigma Ta to the fourth as well. And then when we add those up, that's going to be the constant times the temperature at the surface to the fourth. Um, and so, now we'll combine these guys. So that's just two sigma atmospheric temperature to the fourth equals sigma surface temperature to the fourth. Um, I can divide both sides by my sigma. Sorry to make you guys remember algebra, but those guys cancel each other out. Um, and we can then also see if I take the fourth root of both sides, we'll get 2 
to the one fourth power of the temperature of the atmosphere, that's what's going to equal the temperature at the surface. If you didn't follow that little bit of algebra I just did, no worries whatsoever. Um, the thing to take away from this is that we just found that our surface temperature is going to be bigger than our temperature at the top of the atmosphere, which again, that's that 255 Kelvin number we got from last time, and then times some positive number. So the fourth root of two is, um, gosh, it's a little less than like 1.5. Um, I'm just thinking that in my head. I cannot take fourth roots in my head. Um, most humans cannot. <laughs> um, but we know that this is some number that's greater than one. So when we multiply anything by a number greater than one, it gets bigger. And so we've just increased the temperature of our surface, right? Um, and that's what we see when we kind of think about this conceptually is that, hey, I've got more energy coming in than I did before, right? So if we're putting more energy into the surface, then it's going to warm up, right? That energy, we're gonna sense it as heat. Now, if we were to plug in our number here, multiply it by 255 Kelvin, we're still gonna get a number that's too small. And that's for two reasons. Um, well, really one main reason. That's because we only did one little slab. We pretended the whole atmosphere was just this big, when in actuality, the atmosphere is very large. It's comprised of many layers. So to get a more accurate representation of what temperature is doing, we would need to say, okay, so here's one layer of atmosphere and it exchanges energy with the layer of atmosphere above it. And that layer of atmosphere exchanges energy with the layer above it. And you can think of it like every time you add an atmospheric layer, it's like putting a blanket on top of the earth. Every time we do that, it's just going to keep the bottom layer warmer. If we were going to be like really clever, or this was maybe something we were doing like professionally, um, then we would consider infinite layers and this would turn into calculus really quick. But I think this model really drives home conceptually what greenhouse gases do. I bet some of you are thinking to yourselves right now, wait, does this mean that greenhouse gases are good? Because without them, the temperature would be too cold for human life on Earth or life as we know it to exist on Earth. And to that point, I would just say that generally speaking in science, labeling something as either good or bad is rarely helpful. So are greenhouse gases good is sort of a nonsensical question. If you ask the question, do greenhouse gases increase the Earth's surface temperature? The answer to that is yes. Um, is an increase in Earth's surface temperature a good or bad thing? Kind of depends. If you look at Venus, which has a runaway greenhouse effect, so it has so much specifically carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide in its atmosphere, that the surface of Venus is in a permanent molten state. So we definitely don't want that many greenhouse gases, right? We don't want literally the floor to be lava, but we also don't want none because with none, we wouldn't, life on earth would not exist as it currently does. So what we're going to get at in sort of our next few videos, um, we're going to look a bit at paleoclimate. What is what did Earth's climate used to look like or what has it been in the past? I think that's a fun conversation. And then we're also going to look at something called climate sensitivity. So this is um, how much does a change in some climate parameter affect Earth? hey, if we double the amount of carbon in the Earth's atmosphere, that's a very common kind of basic climate question. If we double the amount of carbon, what's that going to do to the Earth's climate? And really thinking about climate in this sense of like mean global temperature. So that's sort of where we're going. We're going to kind of dig into 
how much carbon dioxide is or carbon monoxide is too much, how sensitive is the climate to changes in that versus other climate parameters. Earth in the past has had way more carbon in its atmosphere than we do now. What did Earth's climate look like back then? So we're going to get some more into the weeds and I hope you guys join me for those future videos. That's all I've got for you today, team. Um, I hope you are well and those you care about are well. Please like, subscribe, don't forget to be kind, and I will see you guys next time.